Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Have you ever had to work together with your significant other? And I don't mean anything like housework or parenting or anything like that. I'm talking about a job, your primary source of income, where the two of you have to work on the same things under the same circumstances, maybe even in the same place. Now, this can go in one of two ways. First, the bond between you grows stronger because you have shared interests and goals and frustrations. Your combined knowledge and talents can make things proceed more efficiently and perhaps in directions two uninvolved people might never think to take. Or things can go south. No life-work balance. Disagreements in how the work should be done. And this kind of thing has led to lots of unhappiness and fights and maybe a breakup. So is it, is it worth it? When it comes down to the history of rock, there are a lot of couples working in the same bands. Sometimes things work out great. Other times these arrangements annoy others in the group. And if the couple breaks up, does the band break up too? Or does everybody just suck it up and keep going? And then there's the worst case scenario when one member of the couple decouples with one member of the band and then couples up with someone else within the same group. What happens then? Time for a little couples therapy. Let's see if we can sort through everything from wedded bliss to horrible divorces and breakups. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Welcome again, I'm Alan Cross, and this is a look at personal relationships and bands through the history of rock and all the goodness and awfulness that can result. John Lennon's marriage to Yoko Ono is said to have caused all kinds of tensions within the Beatles. When Paul McCartney married Linda Eastman, Mako was introduced to her father, Lee, who was an entertainment lawyer who handled the finances of a lot of musicians. When the Beatles were thrown into a management crisis after the death of Brian Epstein, three of them wanted to go with Rolling Stones manager Alan Klein, while Paul wanted to deal with his father-in-law. And that tension, that disagreement, went a long way towards ending the Beatles. ABBA was made up of two couples, and then both couples divorced, which pretty much ended the band in December 1982. The canoodling that went on in Fleetwood Mac during the recording of the Rumors album has been documented many times. It's legendary. Everybody seemed to be fooling around with everybody else. And when all those combinations were exhausted, members started messing around with people outside the band. Yet for some reason, everyone was able to stick it out for years afterward, which must have been awkward. Maybe it was the cocaine. I, I don't know. After all, this is a group that once thought about giving their Coke dealer credit on their album's liner notes. But anyway, there were all kinds of issues with the mamas and papas, the abusive relationship of Ike and Tina Turner. Sonny and Cher were married in the mid-60s and shared a career that spanned records and television until they divorced in 1975. But then there's Pat Benatar and Neil Giraldo, the guitarist in her band. He was her second husband, and they married in 1982. They've been together ever since, and in 2022, were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame together. And here's one more. Wendy Melvoin was a big part of Prince's band for a while. She married bandmate Lisa Coleman. That ended in divorce, but they're still working as musical partners. Let's go through some successful relationships. Chris France and Tina Weymouth were the rhythm section for the Talking Heads. They met at the Rhode Island School of Design in 1973 when Chris was in a band called The Artistics. Tina joined the band in 1975, and in 1977, they moved to New York and became part of the Talking Heads. They married that same year and have been together ever since. There were all those Talking Heads albums. And then in 1980, they formed the Tom Tom Club, a funky dance-oriented band. They've also worked as producers for other acts in sort of a tag team way. And that includes the Happy Mondays and the Yes Please album in 1992. There have also been contributions to records by Ziggy Marley and the Melody Makers, as well as Gorillaz. A happy couple, then. Maybe it's because they've always been in sync rhythmically. Here's another happy couple, Susie Sue and Budgie, the drummer for Susie and the Banshees. The Banshees were one of the founders of modern goth culture, and even though they hated that tag, they are inseparable from that scene. Susie is still considered to be the queen of goth by many fans, even though the group broke up in 1996. 
Budgie joined the band in 1979, about two years after the Banshees were formed and during a personnel crisis that saw the group split in two. The two grew so close that they had their own side project called The Creatures, and in 1991 they got married and moved into an appropriately gothic place, a castle-type thing, in the south of France. That relationship seemed to work quite well, but began to suffer in the early 2000s. And sadly, in August 2007, after so many years, they publicly announced their divorce. They'd been together for about 25 years, married for 15. Susie never remarried, although Budgie did. He has two children. And through it all, they've kept the details of the relationship very, very private. Another long husband and wife collaborative relationship ended when Sonic Youth blew up over an extramarital affair. Guitarist Thurston Moore and bass player Kim Gordon were founding members of the band in 1981. Together with guitarist Lee Ronaldo and drummer Steve Shelley, they made Sonic Youth into the quintessential American indie rock band throughout the 1980s. Thurston and Kim got married on June 9, 1984, and 10 years later they had a daughter named Coco. In 1990, Sonic Youth shocked their contemporaries by signing a major record deal with DGC Records, resulting in a record called Goo. And it was because of this deal that DGC also got their hands on this little band called Nirvana. Kurt Cobain was a huge Sonic Youth fan and figured that, well, if Sonic Youth could sign a deal like this and still retain creative control, then so could Nirvana. And it was Thurston who tipped DGC to the existence of Nirvana in the first place. Nirvana signed, released Nevermind, rest is history. Sonic Youth seemed like such a solid crew. They released album after album, all of which cemented their position as one of the world's great avant-garde rock bands. They even headlined Lollapalooza in 1995. But then on October 14th, 2011, Thurston and Kim announced that they were separating after 27 years of marriage. Why? Because Thurston had a fling with an art book dealer named Eva Prince, she was also married at the time, by the way, and the divorce came through in 2013. Last I heard, Thurston was living in London with Prince while Kim continues to release solo material, work on museum exhibits, and pursue interests in the fashion industry. She also has a memoir called Girl in a Band, which is very good if you haven't read it. Let's go back to the Goo album, a record that turned out to be a major hinge point in the whole history of alternative rock. Here's Cool Thing. with more stories of relationships within bands, both successful and not so successful. So hang tight. This is a program that looks at romantic relationships within bands. Some have worked out wonderfully, others have worked out for a while, and others have been a disaster. Let's go through a few more. The Cramps were an important, and in my view, very underrated part of the New York alternative scene throughout the 1980s. Their sound combined elements of garage rock and surf music and something that became known as psychobilly and gothabilly. The Cramps were equal part punks and horror movie. In fact, singer Lux Interior would later be hired for his ability to scream. If you've ever seen Francis Ford Coppola's version of Dracula, that's not Gary Oldham doing the screaming, that's Lux. The other half of the band was Poison Ivy, Lux's wife. Her guitar style was seen as an essential influence on certain areas of the punk rock universe. In real life, they were Eric Lee Perkheiser and Christy Marlena Wallace. They met in Sacramento back in 1972 and were drawn together by their love of horror movies and record collecting. By 1975, they'd formed the Cramps and were playing places like CBGB alongside the Ramones and Blondie and Talking Heads and Patti Smith and so many others. Other members in the Cramps came and went, but Lux and Poison Ivy stayed together recording and performing until 2006. But then on February 4th, 2009, Lux suddenly died after suffering an aortic dissection, an undiagnosed condition where your aorta, the largest artery in your body, bursts and you bleed out internally in seconds. This is the same thing that killed Andy Fletcher of Depeche Mode in 2022. Ivy and Lux had been married for 37 years. Here's a sample of what they did together. This is from 1984, and you might remember it from the Netflix series Wednesday. <laughs> Here's 
another enduring married partnership, Stephen Morris and Jillian Gilbert of New Order. Stephen was the drummer in Joy Division until singer Ian Curtis died. The band then reformed briefly as a trio under the name New Order and set down the same sort of sonic path that Joy Division had. But that all changed when Stephen's girlfriend, that's Jillian, joined on synthesizers. She'd been a fan of Joy Division and had her own band called The Inadequates. They rehearsed next door to Joy Division, which is how she met Stephen. They started dating even before she was asked to join the band and finally made it official with a wedding in 1994. They're an interesting couple. Stephen was briefly a suspect in the case of the Yorkshire Ripper, an English serial killer who murdered at least 13 women. Police noticed that the location of the murders mirrored that of a 1979 Joy Division tour and thought that Stephen might be their guy. He wasn't, of course, and a sicko named Peter Sutcliffe was eventually arrested. Jillian is tolerant of Stephen's hobby of collecting vintage military vehicles. He owns several tanks that he keeps around the house. They had a New Order side project called The Other Two that recorded two albums. And Jillian bowed out of New Order for 10 years so she could spend more time with one of their daughters who suffered from a serious neurological condition. And a mistake by Jillian helped turn one particular New Order song into their greatest hit. Stephen had programmed a drum machine to be the song's intro. Jillian's part came next, and her job was to trigger a sequencer playing a melody. But because she forgot to put one note into her programming, her part was out of sync with the beat. But rather than change it, New Order apparently was looped on acid at the time, they just left it as it was because the mistake created some interesting tension within the song. It's a good call. This track eventually became the biggest selling 12-inch remix ever. And now that you know of Jillian's mistake, you're never going to hear this the same way again. New Order, featuring the husband and wife team of Stephen Morris on drums and Jillian Gilbert on keyboards. One couple that's deliberately obfuscated their relationship was Jack and Meg White of the White Stripes. For the last time, they are not, nor ever have been, brother and sister. The story begins with Jack Gillis, an apprentice upholsterer and a member of a bunch of different Detroit area bands. He met Meg White in high school. Later, she had a job at a restaurant called Memphis Smoke in downtown Royal Oak, Michigan which is the same place where Jack was bold enough to read his poetry during open mic nights. They got to talking about Jack's music and his poetry, and they talked about her ambitions of becoming a chef. They started hanging out at record stores and music venues and coffee shops, and then they started dating seriously. That continued until they got married on September 21st, 1996. And in a change in tradition, Jack took her last name. So Jack Gillis became Jack White. He continued to play in bands, and she continued to work in the restaurant business until July 14, 1997. Jack had his drum kit set up at home, and Meg suddenly decided to sit down and started bashing away. She had no idea what she was doing because she had no experience on the drums whatsoever. But I quote Jack, When she started to play the drums with me, just on a lark, it felt liberating and refreshing. There was something in it that opened me up. All right, so why not form a band? Okay, but what about a name? Bazooka was one possibility, and soda powder was another. But then they settled on the white stripes, because Meg's favorite candy are those stripy peppermint things that are big every Christmas. Their first gig was at a place called the Gold Dollar Bar in Detroit on August 14, 1997, which was about three weeks after Meg first learned how to play. At first, they pretended to be brother and sister just to throw everybody off. They refused to be interviewed separately, and by 1999, they began recording on a semi-regular basis. But the marriage didn't last, and they divorced on March 24, 2000. However, in an absolutely remarkable bit of amicability, they continued to work together as the White Stripes, even as both of them got involved with other people. Jack and actor Renee Zellweger, Jack and model Karen Elson. In fact, when Jack married Karen, he was in a canoe on the Amazon River on June 1, 2005, and Meg served as the maid of honor. And then when Meg married a guy named Jackson Smith, the son of punk legend Patty Smith in 2009, the ceremony took place in Jack's backyard in Nashville. Even so, the White Stripes had an awesome run that ran until February 2nd, 2011, when they announced that they were breaking up. 
Meg, always very, very shy, wasn't into it anymore and wanted a quieter life. Jack, of course, wanted exactly the opposite. As far as anyone can tell, Meg lives quietly in Detroit, and Jack spends most of his time in Nashville, although he goes back and forth to Detroit. They'll talk, but not that often. Back with a couple more stories of couples and bands, married ones mostly, in just a sec. Keeping a band together is always a challenge. The longer your career, the more things conspire to break things up. And if there are romantic relationships within the group, things can get even more messy. Take the case of Arcade Fire. In 2000, Wynn and his buddy Josh were studying at university in Montreal. That's when Wynn met Regine Sachan. Although she was born in Montreal, her parents are from Haiti and moved to Canada to escape the brutal Duvalier dictatorship. Some of her relatives were even killed in political violence. Like when she was studying at McGill, she was taking jazz voice. And it was while she was singing at an art gallery at Concordia that she met Wynn. Hey, I've got a band, he said, and you should join. So she did. In 2003, they were married, and they still are, despite all the Me Too allegations and Wynn's admitted infidelities that became public in 2022. They have one son, who was born in 2013. Here's a happier story. The Sundays were a great little English alt-rock band in the late 80s and early 90s who had a very pleasant, jangly sort of sound. They met when singer Harriet Wheeler met guitarist David Gavron while they were attending Bristol University in the middle 80s. They started dating, then a band was assembled, and they got a deal with Rough Trade Records. A few records followed with long gaps between all of them. When Rough Trade ran into financial difficulties, they started managing everything themselves, having a few British and international hits along the way. And then, in 1997, they just stopped. Harriet and David disappeared. Fans grasped at any clues. There was a minor revelation when Harriet was spotted at a supermarket. That was enough to freak people out. Harriet and David, who had been married for years, decided that they needed to spend more time with their kids. Okay, fair enough. According to people who know them, they continue to make music but are too paranoid to release anything. And even though one particularly intense fan found their address and showed up at their house, they didn't want to talk. The other two members of the Sundays refused to talk as well. The most visual member of the Sundays is bass player Paul Brindley. He runs a music industry website called Music Ally, which I use every day, and is very, very good. The Sunday's biggest song came in 1990 from an album entitled Reading, Writing, and Arithmetic. And like the trail that leads to Harry and David, the song is called Here's Where the Story Ends. Here's another long-term married couple. In fact, this indie group has been a going concern since 1984. Ira Kaplan and Georgia Hubley would see each other at the same shows at the same record shops in New Jersey. And when they realized they were both fans of the New York Mets, poor guys, that sealed the deal. Yellow Tango started in 1984, and Ira and Georgia have been married since 1987. There were something like 18 Yolo Tango albums, and the group went through 13 bass players between 1987 and 1992. A guy by the name of James McNew has had the job since then. Let's try this. Let's try this. It's from a 1997 album entitled I Can Hear the Heart Beating as One. This is Autumn Sweater from Yolo Tango. Here are more rock and roll couples, married or not. Deborah Harry and Chris Stein of Blondie, a longtime couple, but they never married. Jenny Lewis and Blake Semmet from Britain's Rilo Kiley, dating, but not married. James Eha and Darcy Retsky of the Smashing Pumpkins, dating, broke up, and Darcy left the band. Indie Darlings Matt and Kim, in a relationship, not married. Tim Gain and Letitia Sadie of Stereolab, a relationship, they have a child, but never married and are now separated. I have more. Elizabeth Fraser and Robin Guthrie of the Cocteau Twins. Once a couple, half a daughter, broke up in 1993, but the band managed to last to 1997. Gwen Stefani and Tony Canal from No Doubt. They were in a relationship, but then broke up, yet were able to hold it together as the band went through their most successful period back in the 1980s. 
Then we have Gwen and Gavin Rossdale of Bush, married in 2002, split in 2015. They have children, but were never in the same band together. Same thing with Lou Reed and Laurie Anderson, married, but their careers remain separate. X, the groundbreaking San Francisco punk band. Singer Exine Cervenka and guitarist John Doe were married from 1980 to 1985. She later married actor Vigo Morgenstern. That ended in divorce before she got married and divorced again. And finally, Martha and the Muffins, Martha Johnson and founding member Tim Gain, together since 1981, and despite what you may have read, not married. Black stations, white stations, break down the doors. Stand up and face the music, this is 1984. Black stations, white stations, be on the floor. Like I said at the beginning, being in a band is hard enough, without the lineup potentially being complicated by various romantic entanglements. It is possible to wade through the pitfalls, but as you've heard with these stories, the success rate wasn't great. Such is the human condition. I didn't even mention Kurt and Courtney because that's an entire show on its own. We may have to do that sometime. If you like what you hear, there are hundreds of ongoing history podcasts available through all the platforms. They're all free, so you can just gorge on as many as you want. If you have any ideas for topics, let me know through alan at alancross.ca. We can meet up on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and even some TikTok in there. And my website for music news and information is available 24-7 at ajournalofmusicalthings.com. Get the free daily newsletter, and you'll never miss a thing. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. Talk to you next time. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. 